check, 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 check. There we go. Okay, so that works. Now if I cut to my other thing, check, 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 check. It still works. Okay. I think we're in business, buddy. All right, I'm going to flip this over now. Go black all around. Check, 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 check. Although it's still hearing me. That's okay. Okay. Okay, I'm setting the viz to public now, which hopefully means that, and then I can share this link with you too, Gadali. Okay. Let's see. If anybody found this newly made public link really fast and you're here with me, hello, good morning, hi, excited to be with you guys. Uh, we were set to private on this stream until just a second ago, so we're flipping it over and making sure that everyone has access to it. Give us just a second to get our affairs in order here. Uh, Gadali, I'm gonna chat you a link to this here in, uh, in our Zoom. Okay. And now I'm going to go into the room and see who among my friends are here with me, if anybody. There we go. Yeah, Thatcher made it. Ian made it. Okay, cool. This is awesome. Um, I think it's all working. Hang tight one more second, guys. i got to flip over my reference monitor, and then we'll be good to go. Be right back. Um, okay, friends, I think we're here. I think we're doing grade school. We got a whole new like tech setup stack here today, so hopefully it all works for us. Um, hi, everybody. How's it going? Happy Friday to you. I'm excited to be with you for another round of grade school. Gadali. Oh, let's see. I just went offline. Is that real? If you guys can see or hear me right now, hang tight. Now I can hear you. Okay, cool. And uh, there's something, the stream just got interrupted, I think, as well. Let's see if it's still happening out there. If any of you guys are, are still with us through that speed bump, then hang tight. Let's just see. What's what? Is it still a thing? Okay, it's still a thing. Super cool. Yeah, my actual internet connection just totally dropped for a second there, so I think that's what was going on. Um, okay, I think everything's in order. I can hear Gadali. Gadali can hear me. Apparently, you guys can see me. I think you can hear me. Uh, I think we have the ingredients to do a round of grade school. Um, I hope you guys are doing good. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I've uh, been getting my, my uh, tech stuff upgraded a little bit here for doing YouTube things, so that's... Uh, Exciting uh, and, and uh, always a bit of a learning curve and uh, excited to be with you guys. Today we're going to be talking uh, about, you know, like using LUTs and adapting LUTs for different workflows. So we're kind of teeing off of uh, the video that we put out this week, uh, really in the last day or so, I think, uh, about adapting my Voyager LUTs for use inside of an ACES pipeline. But that's a broader subject, a broader conversation that we can expand uh, really to using 
and adapting whatever LUT we have that we might want to use for whatever workflow that we want or need to operate inside of. So uh, lots of fun stuff to explore there. And I'm also game to broaden out from there and explore uh, other topics if we feel like we've really uh, gotten everything uh, well covered uh, in that area as well. So it should be a good session. Um, I'm trying to think what we should look at right off the bat if there's anything I wanted to show you guys. Um, I'm just going to uh, preview something for you real quick while everyone's finding their way into the stream and into the room and dropping those questions in the chat. Uh, something that uh, I'm playing around with for the node tree that I'm going to kind of like be defaulting to here uh, on the channel going forward is uh, to use a concept that I uh, mentioned in our blended adjustments video kind of late last year in 2023 where if you look at my node tree as I've got it set up right now, this is what I think we're gonna be using going forward here on the channel. I'm actually doing away with like, normally we would have an exposure and a ratio channel. So, uh, or exposure and ratio nodes, I should say. So it would be more like uh, something like this, where we would say, this is my exposure and this is my ratio and then this is my balance. I've also added a sat here. We'll talk about that in a second. But I'm essentially, the first big change is that I'm trying to uh, turn two nodes into one node, where instead of doing exposure here and ratio there, which I think is a really good practice, a really good thing for uh, us to get a sense of the fundamentals and to differentiate between those two things. But I'm actually playing around with the idea of nuking those and just having a prime node where we kind of do everything. And we're just working like offset as well as, you know, like lift, gamma, gain, whatever we want to be hitting kind of all within the same node. So it's essentially our exposure and our ratio all in one place, if that makes sense. It's hey, Colin, can we see your screen? Oh, yeah. Well, no. we'll see. Also, it sounds like your mic volume is just a hair low. Oh, OK. Um, Maybe more than a hair. OK, cool. We can, do, we can do both of these things. Hang tight. Let's see here. One sec, guys. Okay, everyone, I think my mic is still live, even though we're black for a second. So let me know if this sounds a little bit better. And while you're letting me know about that, let me get us set up with our feed. How do I sound and can you see my screen? I think you're probably seeing my, my YouTube settings right now. How's that? future people. I think sound is better now. OK. And uh, on the stream, can you see my uh, Resolve interface now? Yes. Cool. Victory. OK, cool. So what I was saying is where are template node tree previously has been something more like this, exposure, ratio, and balance up top. What I'm going to uh, move us to, I believe, is something more like this, where we have one node that combines exposure and ratio into a single thing, just calling it prime. This is actually the way I used to work, and I found it really helpful in my practice to separate out exposure and contrast ratio into two separate concepts. And I still feel that way. I still feel like it's a helpful thing mentally. But I've gotten to the point, at least in my practice, where I don't feel like I necessarily need separate nodes to keep the concepts or the ideas separate uh, in my grading practice. So instead of an exposure and a ratio, now we've just got uh, exposure and ratio all living inside of one node called prime. So uh, in my case, I'm going to be working like primarily offset to do exposure. And then we can do whatever combination of lift, gamma, and gain, we want to to set our overall ratio. So it would end up being something like that. All right. And then the other change that I'm uh, making is just finally dropping into the template node graph a sat node of the type you guys have seen me do many, many times here on the channel, color space HSV, channel to channel two only. 
And so this is now, I think, going to become the new template node tree. If you guys uh, all feel like these are terrible changes and you hate these ideas, then let me know here or in the comments for upcoming videos because I'm going to be playing around with it at least. But uh, I think it's a fun change that uh, ends up offering a little bit more functionality with the same exact number of nodes as uh, we've had in the prior uh, iteration of the template node tree. And in particular, uh, as we talked about in that blended adjustments video, I just feel like having a single node where we can do all the tonal stuff is more important to me and more of an advantage to me than it is to lose like the explicit separation of exposure and contrast ratio. So kind of a geeky window into a uh, small but I think significant change that I'm going to be making here on the channel going forward. Uh, I'd love to hear what you guys think. And now that we've supposedly gotten everything sorted out with our tech stack and with my sound and with the private live stream and all the stuff that's happened this morning, let's hear if we have any questions. What would you guys like to know about color grading or about adapting LUTs for various use cases? Yeah. Question, uh, what would you say in this case, or how would you use show LUTs for HDR? Is it different than SDR? What's the process for adapting that for HDR output? So uh, when we're asking about show LUTs, I'm going to assume from the context of the question that you mean a camera to SDR transform, like a hybrid transform that you then want to use in HDR. If I'm getting that dead wrong, then let me know, but that's going to be my assumption. So here's how I would think about that. Um, if we are using a camera space or a scene space, log space to display space, uh, to a, you know, like a specific display space LUT, then we're going to have a little bit of trouble if we want to go to a different display space than that show LUT is set up for, because that show LUT just kind of has everything all integrated into it, right? The technical transform and the creative transform, they're all of a type. Easy example of that would be like, you know, the Resolve Film Looks LUTs that have all kinds of fun mojo and character in them, but they're set up to deliver uh, a Rec. 709 SDR image. And this isn't even perfectly using it because I've, I am not teeing this up properly. Let's go down a brief rabbit uh, hole here, or rabbit trail, side, side trail, whatever we want to call it, and actually tee this up properly so that we can use this uh, film looks LUT in the, uh, this case. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use uh, a sequence of things, and I'll tell you what in the heck I'm doing as we go along here. So step number one, we're going to do a color space transform from our working color space into ACES linear, because I want to use an ACES transform to tee things up for this um, uh, film look lot that we're going to be using. So I'm just going to label this. We'll say this is going to ACES, like so. Next, we're going to use our ACES transform. We're going to leave input transform at no input transform, which means actually ACES linear. Kind of a confusing term, but that's what that means. Now for our output transform, we're going to go to the ADX standard, which is somewhere in here. ADX 10 is what I'm looking for. And I'm now going to label this and say to ADX. And with that in place, I'm now applying my 709 film look LUT. And you can see, that's like a lot better than what I was getting before just by doing something that is unfortunately all too common of like, eh, my camera uh, material is in log and this film LUT expects log, so isn't that close enough and can't I just grade through whatever problems I encounter? I mean, you can, people do it all the time, but this is obviously like a very strange starting point for an image. So it's better to do something like this, where you're taking advantage of the ADX standard in ACES, which, by the way, is developed for this exact reason. It's developed to give us a way to map to and from the fuzzy sort of color space or primary set of scanned film negative so that we can do stuff like this or so that we can do the opposite, where we're like, hey, I've got some scanned film material and I want to color manage it. That's what the ADX standard was uh, implemented for, uh, and I'm a big fan of it. So that's uh, kind of how we've got this teed up. But if we now essentially look at everything that we're doing, like if I was actually going to be using this as a show LUT or cooking it as a show LUT in the context that we mean uh, here in this conversation, what I would do is I would cook this down into a single LUT. For now, we can just do a compound node. And let's just call this our show LUT. So the original question is, all right, if we have a show LUT and, we, and it's outputting us to SDR, how should we be thinking about adapting it for HDR? So I would give you two options, two ways of thinking about that. The first way of thinking about that would be if you don't want your HDR to look any different or you only want it to look a little bit different than your SDR, you really just want to get the equivalent mapping into that color space, but you don't want to take advantage of 
uh, the extra dynamic range or of the little bit of extra color that you have in an HDR color space, then this is a perfectly sensible thing to do. And all you would need to do from here is change things around so that you are going from 7 or 9, gamma 2, 4, into whatever your uh, HDR spec is, which is uh, a very common one, would be P3D65 ST2084, like so. And I don't have my monitor set up for that right now, but if I were to kind of simultaneously turn this node and my reference monitor on, and or flip my reference monitor, I should say, into HDR mode, what difference would I see? Basically no difference at all, because I'm just mapping this into a different color space, and then I'm telling my monitor to uh, behave or operate within that color space. So that's a scenario where I don't feel like you should have any hesitation or concern at all about using our kind of mocked up show LUT here, because all we're doing is saying, hey, reproduce what this color pipeline did in SDR in HDR without stretching anything out or needing additional color or dynamic range. That would be kind of use case number one. Use case number two, if you're wanting to do an HDR master that really feels distinct and different from your SDR in terms of the dynamic range that you're using, what you need to do is replace this thing, ideally. There's ways to get around this, like even with what I just did, you could go further and use your tone mapping to kind of like stretch things back out and like unroll your highlights if you want to think about it that way. But I really think that's kind of a recipe for trouble and it's, it's difficult and easy to break stuff. So my encouragement at that point, if you need to do an HDR master, would be to figure out what the essence of your show LUT is and rebuild it from scratch or have someone skilled in that uh, practice rebuild it from scratch for you. Ideally, that's something you don't discover after you've mastered your SDR because at that point, you're a little bit painted into a corner because it's going to be tough to get a one-to-one -one match in terms of rebuilding it from scratch. But those would be the two sort of ideal paths that uh, I would recommend for using a log to SDR uh, style show LUT either uh, uh, in HDR. Either make a very conservative mapping into HDR where you're not stretching things out very much or bite the bullet and rebuild that look so that it's actually operating in a log to log or a scene space and then you can target whatever output uh, or display color space you want to. Hope that helps. Uh, question from Harim. Um, you explained how to use Voyager Light devices. Is there any advantage in doing it that way over the Windows Light Gamma? Yeah, is there any advantage to using the Voyager LUTs in ACES? The only advantage I would say is that there's, there's a potential creative advantage because you're going to get different stuff out of this same, like, you know, however many, like, I, I actually calculated at one point the total number of uh, potential unique combinations of uh, LUT that you could use with all the Voyager ingredients, and it's like many, many hundreds of thousands. It might have even made it up into the millions, but it's many, many hundreds of thousands. And if you're doing this under a different pipeline, i.e. in ACES, you just doubled that number because now you can do all those same things but in ACES and get a different rendering. Now, are you going to like all of those? Are all those going to support your creative intent? Maybe not, but I think that would be the one advantage. It's basically giving you a sound way of imparting a creative look and getting to a different destination than you would be able to with any combination of those LUTs inside of a Resolve Color Management Pipeline. So it's basically just more crayons to paint with if, or, or to color with if, uh, if you want to think about it like that. Question from uh, okay. Here. Uh, last slide, you said that um, the color space transform is sort of a poor man's gamut mapping. Can you tell us what are the other options and what are the best options from your practice? Yeah. So gamut mapping is like one of my favorite topics in the color grading and image science world. It's right there behind mid gray for me. And the number one thing that I've discovered about gamut mapping after, you know, like trying to make somewhat of a study of it is there are very, very few like really robust, really good gamut mapping solutions available to us in like mainstream color grading. The kind of best ones that we have available if you're talking about native or easily accessed things inside of Resolve, I'll offer up two to you. Number one would be your saturation compression here within the color space transform. So just to be clear in terms of the observation uh, or the, 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 the uh, concept you're quoting me on from a recent grade school, what I was really talking about there, if memory serves, is the fact that 
I wish I had a cube in front of me here. Essentially, tone mapping itself is a form of gamut mapping. It's a really poor form of gamut mapping, but it is indeed ensuring that pixels that may have been living outside of our zero to one cube, meaning pixels that can't actually be shown, it's ensuring that those pixels are all being brought back into the zero to one range. And that is, in a sense, gamut mapping. You are bringing out of bounds things in bounds. So uh, that is a form of gamut mapping. It's just not a very robust one because you're not going to get uh, a very good match to the original color. You can still get, uh, like, you can actually lose color. Like, it's not a very great form of it. The slight upgrade from that would be your gamut mapping here, where it is explicitly mapping saturations that are reaching the outer boundary of uh, your destination gamut, in this case, Rec. 709, and those can be brought back in. So I want to see, actually, just before I show you the uh, other example I wanted to, let's see if we have an image somewhere in this timeline with some, I'll bet we can get something out of this log C4 thing. Yeah, like this is actually subtler than I would have expected, but let me just make sure my overall piping for this isn't changed. And then even here, let's just go in and I'm going to boost my saturation in my brand new saturation node, okay? So you can see things are getting weird in this flare here, right? This is with the saturation compression turned off in my color space transform. If I turn this on, I'm going to see a slight improvement in the rendering. You, we can see, whoa, that's weird. Never seen that view of my scopes before. Let's scale those down a little bit. I don't think we need to party that hard. Is this because I'm in full screen? What in the world is happening to me? This is, this is no view of my scopes that I ever want to see. <laughs> Guys, I thought I knew Resolve. It turns out I don't know Resolve at all. I have no idea what's happening to me right now. Let's do it this way. I'm going to just flip this down here into a vector scope and keep that insane popped out scope rendering out of my life. I really have, I've never seen that before. Um, all right, so if we look at this like just in the scopes as well, you can see that this saturation compression is taking this like hard clipped red and just slightly nudging it back in. And you do have some control over like where that compression should start and what the max allowed should be. So that is a, a more robust form of gamut mapping than just relying on tone mapping, which was, I think, my original point uh, in the uh, conversation that you're uh, referencing here. The other option available to us is uh, not vanilla to resolve, but easily accessible. This is a free download that uh, you can grab from, um, actually, Godali, if you can find a link to the uh, uh, gamut mapping uh, DCTL uh, to drop into the chat, that'd be awesome. But either way, this we've done videos on this in the past, and there should be plenty of links to uh, the DCTL I'm about to show you floating around here on the channel. This is to use my CKC uh, gamut compress DCTL, which actually does a much nicer job, doesn't it? This, by the way, is like one-to-one, -one, like uh, borrowed from a solution that the ACES virtual working group on gamut mapping came up with. So this is not my code. This is not my original idea. I can't take credit for the fact that that's working way better than what we were just looking at here. Um, and I actually should have set that to DaVinci Y gamut intermediate like that. But this is like probably your best easily available and also free option for a little bit more robust gamut mapping than you can do natively within Resolve. And then the funny thing is like out in the broader context of the uh, world of gamut mapping, there's all kinds of complex schemes and solutions out there for gamut mapping stuff. And really none of them are being used in mainstream motion imaging right now. It's kind of astounding to me. It's almost like the, the like residue of a more display referred style of color grading is still uh, resident with us in terms of how we gamut map and deal with colors that are in our uh, source gamut but not in our destination gamut. We handle those right now very, very crudely, and we really leave it more to the artist or to the colorist to say like, oh, I don't like what's happening here, and then we end up tackling it with our color grading tools to try to get to a better 
result by pulling keys or by using like a curves adjustment or whatever we might want to do. Um, so we end up kind of like leaving that more to the colorist than we do to uh, like a more robust scheme. So that would be the, the this would be the, the best resource I would refer you to is this gamut compressed DCTL that does a great job. It's still not particularly, it's not everything that I would want in a gamut compression scheme, but uh, it does a really nice job of cleaning things up and giving you uh, a better position to work from. So a bit of rambling about gamut mapping, but like I said, it's one of my favorite uh, topics. And if you want to dive really deep into it, there is a book that's literally called Gamut Mapping Algorithms that uh, was written by one of my color science heroes, uh, a gentleman named uh, Dr. Jan Moravec, uh, who's uh, been studying and been a leader in the field of gamut mapping for motion imaging and for uh, other media for most of his career. Um, so there's some light reading for you if you really want to dive deep on it. If you don't and you want some better gamut mapping solutions than Resolve has to offer natively, grab this gamut compressed DCTL uh, as a, a free download that you can get from uh, the channel here. Question from Nathan. In your vignette, vignette video, you said you use gamma. How do you decide when to use uh, gamma gain, linear gain, or any other exposure adjustment? Oh yeah, good question. So how do you decide when to use those things? I think specifically for, for vignettes, I'm going to uh, assume we're, we're asking about there. Let's get our plate cleaned a little bit here. Let's get some kind of a look in here. Am I the only one who like, I just can't stand to see like just a flat like base reproduction of an image. Like I just want to see, I've got to fly with some kind of look just always. So let's do that. What's that one? Cool, that looks nice. Okay, so we got our look in place here. And so uh, what Nathan is asking about is like when we are doing our vignettes and we're shaping stuff, and let's maybe land on another image here because this one's kind of boring. It's not boring, it's actually, I love this image because it has such a nice range of colors and tones and it's a really good test image that's a little bit less testy than uh, say our Isabella's, which I shouldn't throw shade at either. I've, me, me, and, me and the Isabella and the, the Isabella, uh, successor uh, even have we've been through a lot we've spent a lot of time together my wife calls isabella my my other girlfriend which no disrespect to uh isabella in the picture we've never met and i'm sure you're a nice lady and i'm sure you would not consider yourself to be my girlfriend but it's a joke in the kelly household okay so uh you know like whatever Let, let's say like you know on any of these images um if we're doing our vignette thing and let's just say we want to you know like deepen our fill over here Short answer to the question, how do you decide when to use gamma versus uh, linear gain versus lift versus like regular gain? For me, I've gotten to where like the burden of proof is on those other things to do something that gamma can't do for me. What I like about gamma is that it allows me to like deepen or like dodge areas of the image, but it's pretty hard to clip things out when you're using gamma because like just quick refresher, everybody remember what gamma does to an image? Let's just look at a, uh, a ramp view here and turn off our output transform for a second and let's just go to our waveform down here so you can see this line this is what gamma does so it's making like either kind of like a rainbow shape or a hammock but black and white are pinned okay so that's why gamma has kind of become my default for power windows is it's really tough to clip stuff out when you're windowing things. And instead, you're just going to gently get more shape. And something I will do, like oftentimes where I will break out, for example, lift in a window adjustment, is like if I'm looking at this here, and I apologize for the stream. This is not set up uh, looking perfect for you guys. Oh, actually, quick detour. I've finally gotten into the habit, except for right now, of turning on my Mac OS viewing transform, which is probably going to help you guys to see this image a bit more uh, correctly. Oh, that's not the one I want to do it on. I'm going to, on my color viewer lookup table, I'm going to set this so that my Mac OS viewing transform is active in just in my viewer here and not on my reference monitor over here. Because this looks nice over here, but it looks kind of crunchy over here. And then we need to make sure that we are using Mac displays. Okay, there we go. So uh, back to the question, like one, one common time that I will break out lift when I'm doing a window is when I'm like, oh, I really want to gamma down like quite a bit. And the gamma is starting to make the image feel sort of crunchy and clumped in the shadows now. 
So I might start to counter that with a little bit of lift. So something like that. Now, if there were like some brighter elements in the frame that I feel like the gamma is not biting into, like this is maybe a silly example, but let's just say like, I don't know, I want to do a special on uh, this little reflected bit of window here. If I'm looking at something like that, I'm probably not going to go for gamma here because that's not going to have much influence on the image. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have more influence on the surrounding shadows than it is on that highlight. So instead, I'm going to go right for my gain in a situation like that and then counter it, if needed, with gamma and or with lift, but probably just with gamma in that situation. So that's kind of like my, 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 the, my three go-tos have really become gamma and lift and gain, probably roughly in that order. And I've been doing linear gain less and less because like, when it comes to dodging and burning, it's really not, for me, any more about like explicit photometric movements of stop up or down, and it's more like, I want to shape and blend and dodge or burn an area and integrate it in a more like sort of creative painterly abstract way, if that makes sense. So for that reason, uh, it, I, I start with gamma and then kind of work those other ingredients uh, as necessary. And photos in resolve color management. Uh, Resolve will not correctly display reference photos imported into the gallery. Is there a way around that other than setting the input color space settings and the project settings to Rec 709, then tagging the footage manually? You know, I think there is, and because I don't color manage in nodes often enough, I can't remember. I feel like we stumbled upon the solution to this, or we didn't stumble upon, someone figured out the solution to this uh, during uh, one of the recent rounds of my Colorist Career Accelerator. And Gadali, if you have a, a sharper, less dad brain memory than I do uh, about that, then uh, feel free to chime in. But I, I think there probably is a way to do it. But the fact that you have to find a way and the fact that that's a thing where when you import a still into your gallery, it doesn't look correct when you're color managing in your project settings, that to me is another reason on the long list of reasons to color manage in nodes as opposed to color managing in project settings. That's why that's what I'm doing here and what I'm really going to be uh, you know, like doing everything on here on the channel going forward, just because it's uh, it doesn't produce. There are no gotchas like that with color managing and nodes. There might be things that you need to manually do or pay a bit more attention to, but there are no gotchas like that. We're like, wait, is there even a solution to that? And if so, what? Um, so I know that's not the perfect answer because the perfect answer would be uh, a direct solution, but. I think the solution there would be uh, just to switch over to color managing and nodes. I really don't see a downside uh, to uh, working in that way at all. Um, We solve the mysteries of the universe. Oh, did I not hear me? No, I didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, question. No, that's just uh, that 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 your... that's just my passive aggressive uh, uh, defiance of the question. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. Go ahead. Yep. Isaac is wondering what were your project color management settings for this uh, week's Aces video? Oh, so my project color management settings. Uh, like for the ACES video were this right here. This is what they always are going forward when I'm talking about color managing in nodes. My working space is DaVinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate. My output space, uh, I think in that video I might have been at Gamma 2.2. Two. Um, and in fact, that would, if I set this properly here, it's also going to improve your, there we go. Now the image here and the image there are matching. Cool. Um, so that's what they are there. And the reason I didn't have to change that is because my working space in that video is still DaVinci Wide Gamma and Intermediate. I'm just making a sort of temporary excursion into ACES, uh, or rather, sorry, I might be misspeaking there. No, you know what? I'm dead wrong about that. Opposite of what I was saying. These would have been my uh, color space settings uh, for that ACES video, because this is my working space. And that excursion that I just started talking about a second ago is actually an excursion into DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. So that's how uh, that would have been set up there. And again, just for uh, uh, emphasis, changing these things, 
does not directly change your image at all. The only reason mine changed just now when I flipped this is because I have my uh, use Mac display for color profile uh, viewer, use Mac display color profile for viewers. I think that's what that setting is called because I've got that turned on. But that's not actually going to affect, this isn't, go, isn't going to affect the outputted image over here. So just easy example, if I flip this from 70922 to something zany, if we look at the actual signal that is being output from Resolve, the actual image that's being graded, nothing changes whatsoever. So that's not a direct way of uh, altering your color management. Uh, it is uh, only a way of tagging uh, your workspace as well as your final output appropriately so that Resolve knows how to uh, tag the output file and so that your uh, HDR tools uh, know how to uh, correctly operate and how to be color space aware essentially so that they're aware of the right color space. But that would have been my color space for uh, the ACES videos, just setting that to ACES CCT and knowing that within that ACES CCT realm, I'm going to make that excursion into DaVinci by Gamma Intermediate, apply whatever Voyager LUTs I want to, and then go right back out to ACES CCT. Got a couple questions about the macOS viewer transform. Uh, what are those? Uh, yeah, so we've got a, there's a, a video on this that uh, I definitely recommend checking out because it's going to go into more detail than I can right now. But essentially what it does is if we look at this, that setting that I alluded to, and by the way, as the name in, uh, implies, it's only a solution for Mac. This is not a solution for uh, a Windows system. But on Mac, we've got this magic setting that uh, we have heard talked about probably quite a bit. Use Mac display color profiles for viewers. And we've, uh, I'm sure, been heard both sides of the debate of like, oh, you should always turn that on, or you should always leave it off, or you should have it on only in these particular circumstances. But if you think about like the simplest definition of this, what this is doing is saying, hey, use the color management system that's built into Mac OS. It's called ColorSync. Use it in order to get the image on your viewer, not the image on your reference monitor, but the image in your viewer. Use ColorSync to make that image look correct. So in that broadest definition, that sounds like a good idea, right? Because if we turn it off, I am essentially reproducing a Rec. 709 Gamma 2.2 image on a display that doesn't have those characteristics. And by the way, you can change this, and it says it will affect, take effect next time Resolve is started, but it actually will take effect immediately most of the time. So just watch my image here when I, when I hit OK. So it changes, right? So we want to have that uh, like turned on so that we can take advantage of the system. And then all that we are doing, uh, where did I put that? Let me turn it back on now. All that the macOS viewing transform is doing is making a very small adjustment to correct for a measured incorrect behavior in the way that ColorSync does this. ColorSync actually does a very good job of managing uh, our image that, you know, in this case, it's Rec. 709 Gamma 2.2. It needs to look correct on this monitor, which doesn't have those particular characteristics. ColorSync does an almost perfect job of uh, making that compensation, except for one small little adjustment. And that is what the Mac OS Viewing Transform corrects for, essentially. So it allows you to use your use Mac Display Color Profile for Viewers setting even uh, and get like the proper results uh, on your monitor, essentially. And go check out that video if you want to get uh, a little more uh, into the details on that. Vaidish was wondering about how you create LUTs inside of Fusion for, I guess, either creation or stress testing. Yeah, cool question. So the fun thing that I'm uh, excited to share with you guys that I, I know I've mentioned a couple times this this month and uh, is gonna uh, we're gonna be talking about more and more in the next few few weeks. I've been on like a mission for like the last year or so to stop doing look development anywhere but in Resolve. Like that would be ideal if we had the right tools and the right uh, sort of like flight instruments, if you want to call it that, available to us inside of Resolve so that we never had to leave the color page, right? Even Fusion, like I was really excited for my look dev practice when I started uh, working in Fusion because now instead of going into something like Nuke, like a whole separate uh, compositing program, I can just go one tab over into Fusion. But the short answer, like how are you using Fusion for look development and for stress testing uh, these days? I'm not using it at all. I'm uh, using 
a solution that I'm going to be sharing with you guys in the next couple of weeks that allows us to do exactly what I uh, just mentioned a moment ago, which is to color manage everything, or rather to, to do all your look dev, right within the color page of Resolve and to have all the tools and all the context that you need to do that really well right within the color page. And one of the main reasons for that is because my prior answer to that question, how are you using Fusion for look dev, it's complicated. Like I've done, I did two separate courses uh, in uh, the last few years that were accumulatively like, like 40 plus hours of content trying to break down, here's how I do and think about look development inside of Fusion. And I, I really enjoyed those courses and we had a great time in them, but I still feel like even at, at the end of them, I'm like, did I really do a great job of like downloading everything and equipping everyone to be able to do look development inside of Fusion? I'm like, I'm not so sure. I feel like there's gotta be an easier way. So I'm not using Fusion very much uh, these days, if at all, to do look development because uh, of the tool that I'm gonna be sharing with you guys here on the channel very soon that allows me to do what I used to do in Fusion, i.e. looking at a cube, making more look dev type of adjustments to uh, my image right inside of Resolve. So I know that's a bit of a tease, but I promise it's worth the wait. I'm gonna be sharing some new stuff with you guys on that very, very soon. Question from Jim Robinson. It appears like gamma is not used much, as much by people, but using an audio analogy, if most of the hole is in the mid-range, shouldn't we be scrutinizing the gamma? Yeah. I think that may have been uh, in response to your question uh, or the question about choosing whether to use um, gamma or gain, et cetera. Yeah. Tell it, Jim. I completely agree with that. I feel like I've like... I've backed off of a position that I've held for a while. Like, I got, I, I can only share this with you guys now because I'm sort of like coming out the other end of it. But I've just been on like a multi year journey of like insisting on returning to basics, insisting on returning to photometric units of adjustment, and insisting on returning to like photometric orientation of adjustment inside of color grading. So we're talking the language of cinematography and we're talking to our collaborators in terms of stops and we're thinking and operating in terms of stops. I think that's a massively undervalued thing uh, in uh, the color grading sphere. I'm actually, uh, it, like, I think I can optimistically say that maybe, like, we've helped to move the needle on that a little bit or at least it has moved and the conversation has become to be more, has started to become more inclusive of photometric uh, units of measurement and adjustment as a great way, a great baseline for color grading. But there comes a point, we actually talked about this a second ago with power windows, there comes a point where it's like, all right, after I've set my baseline exposure and you know, like hit my contrast and done whatever I want to do here. By the way, the other thing that this single primary node thing allows me to do that I'm really enjoying is to flip over into luminosity mode for the composite and in doing so to preserve my original colors. That's not having very much of an impact here in this case, but still, a, in many times it can if you're making a bigger, like you know, opening your exposure more or whatever might be the case. So by the time we've done like, I've got a photometric, a baseline photometric adjustment or, or a rough photometric adjustment with my offset, I've already started to work my lift and my gamma and my gain just to shape the image into what I want it to be. So there comes a point where it's like, we've set the exposure and, uh, and we've got the, the baseline exposure in place and now the photometric is no longer the key thing. Now it's really more about the, rendering. It's more about the display than it is about the camera, if that makes sense. And that, I feel like, is where gamma comes into play. As soon as you're away from photometric, like, gamma doesn't really have a photometric basis. It's just a power function that you're using to manipulate the image. But as soon as, you, as, soon as you're not trying to make a photometric adjustment, gamma is, like, I think the most powerful tonal adjustment that you can make because it allows you to get that behavior that we talked about a couple minutes ago where you're controlling the middle but the top and the bottom are remaining pinned. Gamma is like, you know, like here's a, a, a sort of brief tangent for you guys. I've always been amazed at there are like colorists of a certain like experience level and seniority that are out there in the color grading world right now who are doing really good work, like who are really at the top of the game and the way they're getting their images to feel shaped and soft and beautiful and painterly, kind of up and down the tone scale, it amazes me the way they're doing that. Many of these colorists are doing it with just their lift, their gamma, and their gain, and they're not necessarily taking advantage of better look development, or if they are, they're really just using a single LUT that, uh, they, that someone produced for them on their, on their color science team or what have you. 
So they're getting really good results with, in my opinion, really, really suboptimal tools. But the way they're able to get those results, the sort of like linchpin that makes that possible, in my opinion, is gamma, because gamma allows you to create curvature. Um, I know this is a tangent, but this has also become one of my favorite topics. I'm just going to quickly show you guys something. So if we look at, not the grayscale, but uh, the ramp, and if we turn up our output transform stuff and we go to a waveform, gamma is what allows us to do, like if I imagine for a second that I didn't have gamma. All I've got is lift and gain and offset. All I can really do is like change the slope of this line and move it up or down, right? And just look at my waveform down here. I don't really care about the image right now. I just want to make a point sort of in the abstract realm, okay? That's all I can do. But if I have a gamma adjustment available to me as well, I can do stuff like this, where I'm creating curvature and playing things against each other that I simply couldn't do if gamma wasn't there. Now, I don't think that's nearly enough control. I think that's a pretty sad amount of control over curvature. But if it weren't for gamma, we wouldn't even have that. So uh, I, that's, that, that is my, my long uh, sort of like love letter to gamma that uh, has kind of been recently rediscovered after many years of like photometric, like let's make it simple and measurable and more about the exposure than about the display. I think that's a great thing to incorporate into our practice that many of us could uh, stand to do more of. But once you get past that point in the grade and it's more about the image than it is about uh, the way that the image was captured or the way you want to adjust the way that image was captured, gamma is like the go-to for me, like the, the most important uh, sort of like primary tonal adjustment that you can make because it allows you to do things not in straight lines and because it allows you to deepen or open things without moving your uh, very low and very top values of the image. Question from Jeff. How do you export LUTs with uh, node-based color management in order to send them to editors who are in another MRE? Oh, that's a good question. So that has to start with a conversation, for sure. But I'll give you like the, the simple version of it here. What I would do is I have uh, in a lot of like, like actual job uh, projects that I have, I will have a like a LUT outs timeline. And I'll just use this to build LUTs. So like, let's just go through the exercise right here. Of like, let's say whatever pipeline we have right now is the one that we want to cook into a LUT and send to the editor. The way that I would go about doing this is I'm going to just copy my pieces one by one. So let's make the gallery go away for now. I'm going to go onto my input transform. I'm going to tap this node and hit Command C. Go over to my LUT outs. Oh, I need to add an image to this, I suppose. So it doesn't really matter what it is. Let's just add that in there. And now I'm going to uh, tap on my first empty node and hit Command V. Okay. So I've got my first link in the chain set up. Now I'm going to go back over to this images timeline. And I'm just going to uh, grab a still from my timeline level, which is where the rest of my pipeline is happening. So just grab a still, go over to LUT outs, create a new serial node, and then drop this still onto there. So now I've got the full pipeline that is taking me from my camera or my source color space all the way out to Rec. 7 or 9. And now I can just cook this out. Right click and generate LUT, like so. That's the way that I go about that. And the like sort of com uh, companion to that that uh, you need to keep in mind is you need to have a conversation with your editor and say, hey, make sure you're loading the you know, camera original log state files into your timeline. Make sure that those are indeed what this LUT is expecting, which is, in this case, wide gamut 3 log C3. Make sure that that's the state of the image that uh, this LUT is being applied to. But as long as they know that and they're observing that, then uh, this is a very simple, sensible way to cook out uh, a LUT that can be used in editorial, or for VFX for that matter. VFX can use the same LUT in the same way. Uh, and if they want to, underneath this LUT, flip into linear and then flip back into camera color space, that's fine too. Um, but this way they can actually see the way that the uh, comp or the visual effect is going to render in the context of uh, like your particular creative intent or the creative intent that you're helping express for your client. What else? Do you 
We're all caught up. Someone out there has a question that hasn't uh, gotten posed yet, and they're going, Katali, how could you do this to me? Well, I'm just going to color grade in the meanwhile. Yeah, so we're all, maybe we're all caught up, huh? Yeah. Cool. Someone else ask a question? Yeah, let me know, guys. We'll, we, can, we can hang out for another minute or two. We're almost at our, our hour anyway. And in the meanwhile, I'm just going to like kind of play around with these uh, the new template node graph here. Like what I just did here on this image, this is a recap of what we talked about in our blended adjustments video. But uh, this is like the type of thing that I really like to do. In, in I've you know I've been using this type of setup in my grading practice for a couple months now, which is why I'm uh, making the move over to it here in YouTube as well. But this is the type of stuff that I like to do in a prime node when it's like. Okay, I look at this bake, this baseline uh, image just going through the pipeline. I don't really see a need for an exposure adjustment. Like I'm more instantly gravitating toward like, all right, what can I do to like shape and soften uh, the tones in the image? So rather than having to kind of pass through an exposure node and make an adjustment or not and then flip into a new node, I can simply start right away working on my uh, like tonal aspects of it. And like a great trick for this that, uh, again, also goes back to our gamma thing. Let's get this gallery like up out of our way a little bit here. Um, just bring your shadows way up and then drop your gamma way down. Because the gamma is going to give you back that weight that you had before. But because it can't control zero, it can't drive your blacks all the way back down to the floor. So you can get kind of a softer shadow feel than you had before. And it's really just about creating a nice interaction between these two pieces. And what you might find is that you need to, you know, the, those the lift and gamma and gain interact a ton. So you might need to bring down your gain a little bit as you are uh, bringing that lift up uh, on the low end. So, you know, like something like that, that's just giving me a little bit more life in the shadows. And like, if we take this even a step further, this is a move that I've been sort of falling back in love with recently, this connects to our vignette conversation as well. If we just look at doing a nice, big, broad, soft, maybe not so perfect shape around our subject here. So I've already, like, if you look at my note here, I've softened my contrast, like just a little bit, right? Let's move our clips out of the way so you guys have a better shot at seeing this. So that's like soften the contrast just a little bit, which is nice on her, but maybe it would be nice to get a little bit more of that level here everywhere else. So here in node number five, I can do exactly that. Like, actually, let's invert that because I want to work outside of it for this vignette. And I can drop that gamma back down, like so. And if we A, B, like the net of this, you see what I mean there? Like, it didn't look bad to begin with, but like just that primary adjustment, it's created like some softer shadows, it's created some more roundness in her skin tone. And we've still got that sense of inkiness in the surrounding image area. We've just got a little bit uh, less contrast in that center zone. And I actually ended up just touching my lift a little bit on uh, this vignette as well. So I'm going same thing, lift up, gamma down, just in a kind of different proportion than we were doing here. So there's that piece. And then uh, I'm also just doing uh, this sat adjustment that we've talked about many times here on the channel, but just going, um, you know, like in my HSV color space with channel two only turned on, I'm going like gamma up, gain down to try to get like uh, a stronger reaction in like the low to medium saturation areas where like skin lives, for example. So like, I think that's a, a really nice adjustment there. And oh, there was one other thing I was going to show you guys. Oh, let's just try out our luminosity composite mode here as well. Here, let's do it this way. Let's grab a still. This is with no luminosity composite mode. There we go. Okay, so this is where I landed just a moment ago. I'm now going to grab a still of that, and we can set our composite mode to luminosity here and here. Let's see if it makes a difference. Let me get, let me make sure that we're wiping full frame there now. So not a ton of difference, although the small difference I do see, I really like. So here is... Uh, or actually, I take it back. In this case, I liked the rendering of these reds where we were before versus now where they're a little bit brighter. Anyway, I'm on like 
I'm like three tangents deep right now. Um, any other questions pop up? Yeah. Uh, so Thatcher had a question in relation to your um, node tree update, saying would uh, would this not make it more difficult to copy and paste contrast adjustments across many clips that should have independent exposure adjustments? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. It would if you if you're like I feel like this is a good contrast adjustment. I think the idea that I would toy around with there is like I can't remember if if this came up. Were you did I think uh, hopefully a good chunk of you guys were able to join uh, for my conversation with Toby Tompkins uh, for New Year's Eve at the end of last year. Y'all were here for that, right? Did you like that? Toby is so cool. He's like one of my favorite colorists. But a conversation he and I have had. I don't know if it was during that. Uh, live stream, but one that we've had many times is like the almost like compulsion that we share where we're like, if I detect a pattern of like, oh, this contrast adjustment like works for like two or three or five shots and I want it in there, pretty quickly I'm going to try to start wondering if it needs to be baked into the overall look. So a lot of the time I would take a contrast adjustment like that and ship it over uh, and make it part of the overall look uh, as opposed to continuing to paste it. But of course there are still situations where it's like, all right, this setup or this scene or this sequence needs that particular pinch of contrast, but it's not appropriate for the overall look. And yeah, you're right in that case, Thatcher, that it might in that situation be easier to have a dedicated uh, node for your contrast. Although what you could say is in a situation like that, if you discover such an adjustment, you could say, well, I'm going to borrow everything but my offset. And I don't think you can actually separate that out. Now, because primaries are primaries, but you could like with a minimum amount of effort, like let's just say for the sake of example that this is my primary on this uh, shot. So I've got lift, gamma, and offset adjustments here. Now if I wanted to make this a repeatable ingredient, I could like just hit Command C, go over to the very next shot where I want to see just that contrast adjustment take place, and then I could turn off my offset and now I can tap that note again and hit Command C, and now I'll just be pasting that particular contrast adjustment without taking the offset or the exposure component. So I still think you can think about exposure and implement exposure as distinct from contrast ratio or tonality, but I lately am really, really uh, like intrigued by the idea of doing that all in one place so that you can kind of fluidly toggle in between those two very interactive considerations. All right, we got time, I think, for one more, if we got any more. Yep, a uh, question from Kian. In one video, you applied a saturation adjustment across two nodes, uh, HSD gamma up, and then HSL gain down. What is happening underneath that made you choose HSL to gain down? Oh, yeah, uh, that's a, a, a fun one to end on. So short answer here, or as short as I'm ever able to do. <laughs> um, Fundamentally, like with if we look at HSV, like let's start with like why do we typically like to use HSV for saturation? It's because it's getting us that like kind of subtractive style saturation where like you know my histogram is really not going up as I increase saturation. The mass of the signal is staying down when I go positive with my saturation. Those rules flip backwards when you are going negative. So when I'm doing like ideally. I could do gamma, I could do HSV gamma up, and then I could do HSL gain down all in one node. You can't do that natively inside of Resolve, but if you could, that's totally what I would do. Because if we look at, like, let's just do that experiment here, we're in HSV right now, and let's just gain it down. I'm going to go kind of far just for the sake of example here. So this is HSV gain down. Watch what happens when I go to HSL gain down. It gets thicker, it gets more subtractive when the direction is negative. So when you're doing positive saturation, oftentimes what you want is HSV because that's going to be subtractive in that direction. When you're doing negative saturation, oftentimes what you're going to want to do is HSL because that's going to be subtractive in that direction. So again, negative sat in HS, where are we? There we go. Negative sat in HSV is here. And let's make this a little bigger for you. Negative sat in HSL is there. That's kind of cool, right? I remember that was like a, I, think, I feel like I might have like stood up from my desk and, and like done some kind of yippee when I figured that out one day. 
but I hope you find that interesting. That's kind of my general logic when I'm doing SAT adjustments with HSL versus HSV inside of Resolve. Um, OK, guys. I want to thank you, as always, for joining me for my Friday morning grade school session. It's always great hanging out with you guys. I'm glad we got the tech sort of uh, sorted out and working for us today. Um, thanks, good to, thanks to Gadali for co-hosting with me. Uh, we got some new videos coming out next week. Uh, I've got or a new video anyway, uh, and uh, more to share soon on uh, this uh, plugin that I keep teasing you about uh, right within the color page and Resolve. Really excited to share more with you guys about that in the coming weeks. So hope you have an awesome Friday, awesome rest of your weekend, and I will see you next week. Take care, guys.